Ladies and gentlemen, for the final time, this is Azealia. Please welcome your hosts, Dr. Jeff Carroll and Dr. Ed Wilde. Thank you very much and welcome for the third and final time to Bazilia, our live roundup of the day's exciting events and exciting events yet to come here from the World Congress on Huntington's Disease in Rio de Janeiro. Once again, we'll be bringing you some uh, of our personal highlights from the day's scientific presentations, the return of the generation game quiz, and of course, uh, the all-important weather forecast. But for, uh, first, before we start, we'll be doing yoga in a moment, but we just want to take a moment to thank uh, some very important people, uh, some uh, volunteers who help us translate HD Buzz, uh, which is available in 12 languages. Uh, so we heard today that there are 600 million people living in Latin America, and so there's bound to be a large number of Huntington's disease patients uh, in this uh, community. And so we're excited that a lot of the content on HD Buzz is available in both Spanish and Spanish and Portuguese to hopefully uh, assist these families as they try to learn about their condition. And uh, all of our translation is indeed done by volunteers who give their time freely to translate uh, into languages including Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, I think there are one or two at least uh, HD Buzz translators in the audience. So if you translate for HD Buzz, please stand up. There we are. And please give them a warm round of applause. And I know that the people watching at home will, uh, a lot of translators will be watching this video and indeed translating it, and they will appreciate that round of applause. So thank you for that. Uh, and finally, uh, in our uh, preliminary remarks, a, a brief shout out for the uh, International Huntington Association. Uh, they've just elected a new board and are making a new start uh, with a big push to link together all the countries, uh, uh, agencies fighting Huntington's disease. Uh, so if you're interested and you want to get involved, please email uh, the international president, Ann Jones. Uh, her email is there. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so once again, it's time to reboot our tired and weary chakras with a little spot of yoga. Uh, and today's pose is the seated camel, which I think describes many of us. Ustrasana. I don't know why I said that with a Brazilian accent, but there we go. Um, the local culture is obviously rubbing off on me. Um, so here's what we're going to do. I'll put my clipboard down. So the seated camel pose is a very powerful pose and uh, can prevent uh, attack by uh, giant crabs um, and guarantees fruitful uh, dreams. So here's what we're going to do. It's, it's all done seated, so feel free to stretch, uh, but you need to be sitting down. I suggest you move to the front of your chair. I'll uh, hover on the edge of the couch. And of course, we're first going to refocus our breathing and focus our attention inwards and let the cares and worries of the day slip away, especially those who are about to come on stage and be interviewed and be part of our quiz. So we're going to stretch our arms upwards to the ceiling, and we're going to look up. Now, we're going to pass our arms behind us. You can either put your hands on the back of your hips here and point your elbows towards the back of the room. Or if you, if you feel like a slightly more vigorous stretch, you can put your hands on the back of the seat behind you, on the flat part of the seat behind you. And we're simply going to look up and push our elbows back and push our chests forward like the proud camels that we are. <laughs> Breathe deeply. Bathe in the warm glow of the healing energy and relax. I'm very excited there's going to be a video of me doing that on the internet now. I should have sat somewhere else. Uh, so uh, let's please move on uh, to the highlights of the day. Ed, uh, what stood out for you? So for me, uh, I mean, I, we talked about biomarkers yesterday. Uh, for me personally, today's highlight was a, a mention uh, in a session with uh, Tiago Mistre. Uh, who unfortunately we were hoping to interview, but he had to leave. But he was talking about a uh, collection of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. Um, and this is a, a clear fluid which uh, bathes and surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And you can collect it by sticking a fine needle into the base of the spine. Sounds pretty gruesome. Well, it sounds much worse than it is. And when it's done by inexperienced hands, it's pretty well tolerated. And it's it's actually not that much different from a blood test, although there's a bit more fuss before and after. 
And of course, we both know this because you had a lumbar puncture several years ago at the hands of Dr. Blair Levitt uh, for HD research. Personally, I'm willing to do almost anything, obviously, <laughs> for HD research. Uh, and, and I had one a couple of weeks ago uh, in August uh, because we were collecting CSF and we needed control uh, uh, fluid. So I volunteered and also to see what it's like. Uh, I t tweeted the experience. In fact, this is a video of me having my... You can see the fluid dripping out there. Yeah, gruesome. Uh, and that's me uh, covered in antiseptic solution. I'm giving a thumbs up there. You're curled up like a baby. And actually, in all honesty, I felt virtually nothing. This was me. That's my spinal fluid. <laughs> uh, and if you're interested, well, this is a round of applause for anyone who gives CSF for Huntington's disease. Uh, if you want to read uh, some of the tweets before, during, and after, that's where you can find them. And um, uh, tastes a bit like chicken. <laughs> for the record, I did not drink my CSF. Um, okay. Uh, so this sounds like something that's uh, useful for families to do if they want to contribute? I would say so. I mean, it's certainly not for everyone. It's, it's not a typical walk in the park kind of thing to do. Um, but if you're inclined to be as helpful as possible for Huntington's research, I, and, and there happens to be a project uh, running that you can uh, sign up for, I would encourage it. And there'll certainly be more spinal fluid collections coming up because uh, measuring the levels of various molecules in the spinal fluid is certainly going to be an important way of hopefully... Um, uh, running trials in Huntington's disease. So one way that we can figure out if a drug is working is to see whether we see the expected changes in the spinal fluid. But in order to do that, we need to be looking at the spinal fluid now. Cool. And since this is our last uh, live Bazilia session, I wanted to uh, glance ahead quickly to what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, which is a session on emerging new treatments and therapies, which is obviously a, a huge interest and, and really exciting for everyone here. Uh, Professor Bernhard Landvermeier is going to give uh, an overview, a talk of where we're at in terms of uh, therapeutic development. Uh, and uh, I'm also particularly looking forward to updates on gene silencing approaches to Huntington's disease, so switching off the harmful Huntington gene. About which more in a moment when we speak to Neil Aronin. But I think in general, it sounds like we are, uh, like new treatments which have been developed specifically for HD are, are really going to be entering, and several of them are going to be entering clinical trials in the next year or two. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of the fruition of decades of careful science, science that's happening, really exciting new things happening just in the next year. Cool. Okay, so we'll move on to our interview segment. And our first uh, lucky interviewee, actually we're very lucky to have him with us, is uh, Jim uh, Gazella from Harvard Medical School. Now Jim is a legend among Huntington's disease researchers. Um, he was uh, critical to the discovery of the gene and all of the work that led to that. And he's remained... Uh, one of the most prominent researchers on the genetics of Huntington's disease. So please welcome him to the stage, Jim. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Have a seat on our opulent yet minimalist couch. So, Jim, we're going to start with a really easy question. What is a gene? So that's a more complicated question than you'd think, yeah. um, but I'll try to give you the current definition because it's actually a moving target. Uh, the, the DNA in an individual carries a code for making the various components of the cells of the individual. And to do that, it has to have its message copied, and it gets copied into a related molecule called RNA. And then that RNA is read by the machinery of the cell in many cases to make a protein. So the current definition of a gene is that bit of DNA that makes an RNA that is functional. Because some RNAs, as it turns out, don't get made into proteins. But they still do things in the cell that are still being worked out as to exactly what they do. Is that clear enough now? That's exceptionally clear. I think that does deserve a round of applause. That is actually, and I did know this, that's actually an extraordinarily complicated question. And a bit of a, what did you say, curveball, right? That's the American thing to say. A bit of a curveball. Yep. A googly, we would say, although I don't know anything about cricket, so I don't know where that word came from. Um, okay, so that's what a gene is. And in my very, very simplistic way, if I were to say a gene is a recipe for a protein, would you be very cross with me? Very angry with me. Uh, that was, I think, probably the best accepted definition up until about five years ago. Okay. 
I'll take it. I'll take it. Probably when you so, went to school. Then. Yeah. yeah. To nursery school. Okay. So, um, so, and of course, the gene that is closest to the hearts of everyone in this audience and everyone watching at home is the the, the gene that causes Huntington's disease, which is the Huntington gene. Well, yeah. If you believe that nomenclature. Okay. It's actually the HTT gene. HTT and gene. Huntington is the product of that gene. Okay. Every day is a school day. Okay. Um, so, since we know that that gene produces the protein that causes Huntington's disease, why do we need to think about any other genes? Well, it's like uh, if you think about a car and you're driving the car and all you have in your hands is the steering wheel. Is that better? Perfect. Oh my god, that gets so loud when you do that. If all you had in your hands was the steering wheel and there was nothing else there, you wouldn't get very far. Uh, the Huntington is a protein. It matters, it does things, but it does it in the context of a lot of other proteins and other components of the cell. Uh, so you can't consider it by itself. You've got to consider it as part of the machine that it works within. And that's why we've got to worry about the others. Now, as it turns out, um, the others are not constant. The others vary just like Huntington varies. They don't vary in, in ways all the time that cause disease. Sometimes they just vary in normal differences between individuals. And so one of the things to think about when we think about Huntington's, not as a worry, but as an opportunity, is if we can figure out how Huntington works in different circumstances of people who have variations and find those where it doesn't cause as bad a disease, maybe a later onset or uh, a less severe course, um, then we can use that information. So, so we don't have to just worry about it in terms of how does Huntington work, but maybe as taking an opportunity to make it uh, a, a clue to a treatment. Cool. And, and that's what a genetic modifier is, right? It's a gene which alters the... Well, you tell me. Well, now, you see, you've, you've taken the tick off of genetic. I'm sorry about that. So a genetic modifier isn't necessarily a gene. It is a variation in the sequence of the DNA that when you find it, you don't immediately know how it works necessarily, but its presence results in a difference in what you see in an individual. So if, if what you're looking at is the symptoms of Huntington's disease in an individual, and you find that those people who have a certain sequence in their DNA never show psychiatric symptoms, for example, that would be a genetic modifier. And you'd then have to go in and look at that DNA sequence and say, how does this work? Does it work because it's part of a gene? Or does it work in some other way because it's regulating something? So it's complex. So it's complex, but tremendous opportunity because looking at the genes is finite. There's only a limited amount of DNA in a person, about three billion bases. You can look at all of that at once. It's, a, it's very different than looking at the universe of environmental factors that might be involved because you can essentially look at a closed system and gradually eliminate all the differences as either not meaning anything or being very important. Now, so you were instrumental in the discovery of the genetic marker 30 years ago and the gene 20 years ago. We have a lot of genes. You can imprison them all in a lab and study them until you have your answers. So, do we have genetic modifiers? Do we know what they are? Uh, we do not have genetic modifiers that we know precisely what they are in humans and precisely what their effects are. There, is, there are proof of principle genetic modifiers in uh, knock-in mouse models where specific genes have been found that modify the disease. Uh, there are candidate modifiers that have been found in humans that represent DNA sequences that look like they're having an effect, but it's at a very early stage in the sense that finding uh, spurious results when you're looking at millions and millions of possibilities all at the same time uh, is very frequent. And so you have to go out of your way to prove that what you think is true, in fact, is not a spurious result. We're in the midst of that right now as part of a, a worldwide collaboration that 
is looking at thousands of Huntington's disease patients. And uh, people who follow HD Buzz or follow the news from these sorts of meetings very closely might be familiar with the with what's been happening in the past couple of years, which is that we we thought we had found some genes that looked pretty good, and it looks like maybe a, a more careful relook at that has has maybe taken those off the table. What happened there? Well, the the uh, way that you would look for modifiers has changed with improving technology. It used to be probably up until um, six or seven years ago that you could really only pick one gene and look at it and say, does, does this vary between people? And so you might, in fact, come to the point that it does vary and that in a small sample of a few hundred people, it looks like the people who have a certain form of the gene have, let's say, later onset of the disease. But you're studying that gene without taking into account the 25,000 other genes that you haven't looked at. And so we now have the ability to look at them all simultaneously. And it, and it comes down to an analogy that, that I used earlier today in one of my talks, which is that if you think about flipping a coin, if you flip a coin eight times and get heads eight times in a row, you're going to think that that's a coin that is fixed. But if you flip it, flip it a thousand times, you're almost guaranteed during that thousand times to find eight heads in a row at some point. So it's like that with genetic modifiers. If you only look at a few and then home in on the ones that look positive, you, you've picked things that may not be true. But if you've looked at all of them, and then looked at only the ones that are positive, you're going to find things that are real. We now have the ability to look at all of them. So by, by taking that new technology and looking back at the old ones, we found that, in fact, we were being optimistic about the old ones. So in a sense, I mean, it may sound like, good, like bad news that, we've, that there are things that used to be modifiers, but maybe not. But actually, my way of looking at it would be to return to the idea that science is cumulative and actually what's happened is that we now have better tools for distinguishing between, between spurious results and, and re really solid results. We have better tools and the positive in it is also that in the past when you identified a modifier that you thought was real, you then had to go and prove it biologically. You had to go into a biological system and study it. And, and doing that is a lot of work a lot of expense and a lot of time and isn't always definitive. Whereas with the genetics now, because you can look at everything at once, you can come to a definitive result without ever going into the biological system by pure statistics. Mm -hmm. and, and then when you do go to that work of going to the biological system, you know you're working on something real. So, so you've also avoided work by now eliminating those things uh, that, that enable you to go directly to the uh, the biological system when you don't need to, you, you've gone away from it, you can get the proof that something's real, and now just study it. Saves a lot of time once you've got it. Fantastic. And so the work goes on with huge sample sets with thousands of patients who've donated their DNA, and you're optimistic. I'm very optimistic, uh, and you know, that said, it's just a starting point because the way that these genetic modifier studies work you don't look at a sample and find something and then it stops. The more samples you have, the more you're going to find and the more samples you have that have different characteristics of the disease described in them, the more different kinds of things that you can find. So it's a cumulative process where the initial modifiers that you find give you something to work on that you know changes the disease, but you also know that as you look at more samples, you're going to find more things that change the disease and put together a better picture of exactly how to change it. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Best of luck with the Thank ongoing you. work. And uh, now we're looking forward to a scientist who's speaking tomorrow and uh, who works on this hot new uh, gene silencing drugs, Neil Ronan from the University of Massachusetts. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Have a microphone and a couch seat. Thank you. So, uh, gene silencing. Uh, everyone, uh, I think as Ed and I talk to patients, this is, this is definitely the thing we hear about the most. Um, but a lot of people, of course, who will be watching won't, won't know what this is. So can you give me the sort of uh, quick definition of, of this approach for therapy? Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, Jim 
had organized the DNA and the RNA and the protein, because it makes my line of reasoning a lot easier. Uh, gene silencing is actually a, w a way to prevent the messenger RNA to make the protein. So we have this HTT gene, it makes this intermediate molecule, and then that turns into the protein. That's correct. And, uh, and the uh, endogenous, or the natural RNAs that do this are those small, non-coding RNAs that Jim mentioned. Uh, they don't make proteins. They don't make proteins, but they do make small RNAs that can recognize messenger RNA and regulate them. So they regulate normally. They regulate how much of the messenger RNA is made to then make protein. So we, the idea is to sort of hijack this natural process that exists in cells and instead tell it, hey, go get rid of the bad Huntington gene. That, that's correct. Okay. There, there are two natural processes. Uh, the first one that was discovered was actually in worms. And these RNAs were made into two different strands that were connected. And that's called an SI, or small interfering RNA. Now, we don't make those. We make what's called the micro RNA, which is about the same size as the sRNA, but there's only one strand. And we have probably close to 1,000 of them. And the majority, uh, I'd say two-thirds, are in the brain. So um, on top of the complexity of these normal things that we make. There's also the complexity, I think we hear from patients often that they hear about ASOs and RNAi. There's these different um, molecules that seem to be doing the same thing. So could you just explain briefly the different approaches? Sure. The ASO is a synthetic uh, 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 molecule that's made mostly of DNA. So that's what genes are made of too. And they're about the same size. They're single strands, about the same size as an siRNA or the microRNA. But they work in a very different way. The ASOs get into a cell and then combined with a, uh, uh, an enzyme or a protein that cleaves other proteins called RNase H. The, there are advantages to the ASOs and there are advantages to the microRNAs or the siRNAs. ASOs usually require a lot more to get into a cell, and it's more difficult, as you know, because you were a participant in some of these studies, it's more difficult uh, to know ahead of time how it's going to work. The siRNAs and the microRNAs can actually been, be experimentally designed and can work with much smaller concentrations. So one thing I think, um, and I was going to bring this up, just just a full disclosure, I work on sort of a different technology than you've worked on. And I, I think sometimes when patients and families hear that, they think, this is so stupid, they're, they're competing in some sense against each other. And I think as a scientist, I naturally think it's actually a really good thing. And I wonder if you could, you could speak to that, how you feel about that. How do I feel about the competition? <laughs> I don't know. But is it good for science or is it bad for science? It's actually, they could be complementary. Yeah. Uh, as it turns out in some early studies, the ASOs, may get to certain areas of the brain better than small RNAs or RNAs that are embedded in a virus that we put in. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So you can envisage that in the future there could be treatment with an ASO complementary to those with the RNAi. And in a way we wouldn't have known this if different labs weren't working on different approaches. Correct. At the beginning. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, we've read uh, your name uh, a couple times in connection with, of all things, uh, sheep and doing research in sheep. So could you explain, like, just why on earth would you want to study sheep? And I'll give you the explanation that I gave my mother, who said, I thought you went to medical school, and I'm working on sheep. Um, and you could understand that. So uh, CHDI has organized a colony of sheep that have the mutant Huntington gene. It's a transgenic sheep, and it was put together. This is a worldwide effort. It was put together by a laboratory headed by Richard Fall uh, and, uh, and Russell Snell in uh, Auckland, so in New Zealand. The sheep are grown and reared in an Australian sheep farm. 
which we actually visited, um, and it looked like a sheep farm to me, but what would I know? And, uh, and we have organized treatment of these sheep with an adeno-associated virus that has a microRNA or small RNA that will target the mutant Huntington. And the reason we're doing that is we want to establish safety because you hear that all the time. We need to show that these AAV siRNAs or microRNAs are safe and don't damage the brain. And also some efficacy, how much knockdown or elimination of the gene we can expect. So how well do they work in a bigger brain? Yeah, we, we plan to do this in late November, and we have about 120 sheep to our disposal. Brilliant. Well, we'll leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. Jim, you may return to your seat. Neil, we have further fun for you. Thank, please give them a warm round of applause. Thank you. So, you'll be thrilled to hear that it is now time for the return of our quiz, which combines science, entertainment, and gentle humiliation. As a young scientist and an elderly uh, dinosaur, I guess, pit their wits against each other for the chance to win the coveted Money Cannot Buy HD Buzz hat. Roll the theme music. And uh, here's representative Vation that brought us talking about Einstein, all the way from the couch, we saw the Neil Ronan. Neil Ronan. And uh, representing the generation that brought us such great minds as Lady Gaga, Justin Timberlake, and Jedwood, a talented young postdoctoral HD researcher from University College London. Please welcome Dr. Nicola Hobbs. Please rise. <laughs> so again, we have uh, two rounds, uh, starting with science and then uh, some general knowledge. Uh, Neil, Nicola, are you guys ready? Yeah. Right. You both use magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, uh, scanners to study the brain in Huntington's disease. These use powerful magnets. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question, hold the thought in your head. But how many times stronger is the magnet of a typical three Tesla MRI scanner compared to a typical fridge magnet? Hold your answer. What I'm going to ask is for uh, Dr. Ronan to give us uh, his guess, and all you need to say, Nicola, is greater or lower. 1066. 1066. <laughs> 1066 times more powerful. Right. Higher. Higher. The answer Higher in fact, 600 times. Oh, no. The point uh, <laughs> to Dr. Ronan. Uh, so for reference, a fridge magnet for all of you uh, magnet geeks out there is roughly point z uh, point zero 0.05 uh, uh, milliteslas. Fascinating. <laughs> okay. Ready? So once again, your guess and then... Uh, Higher or lower? And you can, the audience can help with the, uh, Nicola's uh, choices here. True game show stuff. <laughs> this is, uh, incidentally, the actual data from the first human MRI. Uh, in what year was the first human MRI scan, Neil? Uh, 1974. Nicola? Later. In Excuse fact... Me. 1977. Ah, Dr. Hobbs has it. It was a very good guess. That was, that was uh, neck and neck. Uh, and interestingly, uh, uh, this technique was uh, quickly, relatively quickly, applied to uh, human Huntington's disease. So in what year was the first report of an MRI scan being used, published, uh, about using MRI in Huntington's disease? Okay. Say 1983. Okay. Audience, any suggestions? Grumble, grumble, grumble. Nothing useful at all. No. I think slightly later. Slightly later. What did you say, Neil? 83. 83. You said later. The answer is, you probably can't see it, but it was actually 1982. Oh, no. Mm. Well, very good. <laughs> They're both excellent. You're very good, <laughs> Jeff, I'm actually keeping score tonight. Oh, that's nice. Can you believe it? OK, that, that was the science part. I think your jobs are both safe. <laughs> um, so the next round is general knowledge. And we'll begin with some questions, individual questions on music. So no conferring. I guess you're allowed to use psychological tactics to intimidate your opponent. So the first question is for Nicola. Who is this famous musical figure 
who produced such classics as Eine Kleine Nachtmusik, Don Giovanni, and Mozart's Piano Concerto Number no. 21. <laughs> Mozart. Mozart, that's absolutely correct. This is Mozart. Well done. Point uh, for Nicola. <laughs> and uh, next question for Neil. Who is this popular musician? <laughs> Famed for such hits as In the Club, I Get Money, and of course, Candy Shop. Can I switch? <laughs> <laughs> I actually knew Mozart, I don't know. You have no idea. <laughs> Do you know the names of any rappers? <laughs> None. <laughs> Nicola, you can steal the point here if you wish. Yeah. It, I'll, give you a, <laughs> I'll give you a point if you can something name a rapper. Sense, something. something to do something with sense. sense. Yes. Half How many cents? 50. 50 cents! That's absolutely <laughs> correct. Well done. Point stolen there. The beginning would seem a little unfair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to a couple of questions about local knowledge now. First question for Nicola here. What are the main ingredients of the classic local Brazilian cocktail, the caipirinha? Ooh, I've had one of these. Uh, and li- therefore, you can't remember what's in it. <laughs> <laughs> Lime juice? Mm-hmm. Sugar mm. and cacacha. I think technically cachaca, but you certainly get the point for that. Excellent. For a bonus point, what is cachaca made from? Uh, sugar cane juice. Is the right answer. Storming ahead. I'm in You're such in. trouble here. You're in serious trouble. I'm in serious trouble. You're going to have to use some devious tactics okay. to win here. Okay. And there it is, the beautiful caipirinha. Mm. So, Neil, this is a question about local culture. Okay. What is a lusophone? Uh, a lusophone. <laughs> Could you use it in a sentence? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll give you a sentence. Oh, look at that lusophone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now it's perfectly clear. Um, it's a street phone that's near the beach. It's, a good, it's good, but it's not right, as oh. they used to say on a catchphrase in the UK, which you won't know about. It's another rubbish game show. Uh, I'm afraid that's, that's my, my very <laughs> long-winded way of saying that was not the right answer. A loser for anyone in the audience, or Nicola? No. Someone who speaks Portuguese. Um, a tenth of an HD Buzz hat for Dr. Waite there. Uh, yeah, so a loser phone, someone who uh, speaks Portuguese. As I say, every day is a school day. So, next question for Nicola. As depicted here, what is the national dance of Brazil? Samba. Samba is the right answer. Point. And <laughs> Dr. Ronin. And uh, turns out this is the final question for. Uh, no hope of winning. Four, four points. Why not? <laughs> oh, well. Please, uh, <laughs> please demonstrate the samba. <laughs> samba. <laughs> Truly magnificent. There's no fair conclusion except they both get a hat. We only have one hat. We'll cut it in half. Okay. We'll give the hat. It's a draw. It's a dead heat. But Nicola gets the immediate hat. Neil, you get a hat later. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful Enjoy work, it. both thank of you. you. And thank them, please, for being a sport and entertaining us with science. You, are, you may now uh, leave the stage. Humiliation complete. <laughs> And of course, Neil will be back tomorrow for more uh, fun and science. So, for the final time, the hour has come. It's time to welcome to the stage the man who puts the for into author. He's the man who puts the oath. Bad time for the microphone to cut out. He's the man who puts the oath into sugar loaf. He's the man who puts the cont into raconteur. He's the man who puts the Charles Sabine into the phrase, Charles Sabine is about to come on stage. He's wearing a collar that will give him an electric shock if he swears again. Please go wild for Mr. Charles Sabine. And I'm going to stay still in this place. Right, weather, quickly. Okay. Yeah, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. I have to take it all back. 
The Rio weather forecast was not crap at all. That's not a swear word. Uh, and it was absolutely right. Let's just hope it's wrong tomorrow. Now, after this wonderful Basilia event in this very room is something that has never been tried before in an HG World Congress. Uh, for almost a year, Ding Dang Dong, has, uh, which is a group of artists and researchers based in Paris, has been working with HD families uh, to create something called From Huntingdon's Land with Love. Um, it uses every imaginable medium um, from literature and poetry and dance and video to explore the disease, and I use their words, as if it were an unknown planet. Now, how interesting is that? I say it's going to be a unique opportunity to witness something highly ambitious, visually spectacular, a year in the making. Do not miss it. It will be on at 6.30 right in this room a few minutes from now. It will just take a few minutes to change the set here. If you have to go to the bathroom, go, but otherwise stay in your seat. It won't be long. Just hold on here. Here we are at the end of day three. I want to thank the organizers for a fantastic Congress uh, on behalf of the families. And on behalf of, on behalf, um, of the uh, organizers, I want to thank the families for being here. But most of all, I also want to thank two specific groups of people from a personal point of view. One is the Bazillions, I think I shall call them, doctors Ed Wilde and Jeff Carroll, and behind the scenes, <laughs> behind the scenes, Mark Sutton, who's, who's sort of here. You probably see the back of his head. Right um, these guys make this whole thing look fun because that's the objective of it. But I can assure you, do not underestimate the amount of work that goes in to the preparation for these things. And of course, that let alone their devotion, extraordinary devotion week after week on the, on the HD Buzz website. It is not just groundbreaking, that website, but it is changing the lives of uh, people. And I regard it, for one, as a privilege to know these guys. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank the Latin American Network. Um, it's not a coincidence that we are here in Rio. It wasn't just a matter of, uh, you know, where haven't we been with the World Congress? You know, oh, we haven't been there. This is a deeply symbolic moment that we are here in Rio, and we wouldn't be here without the Latin American Network. Um, their selfless, tireless dedication is bringing at last uh, some recognition to the most terrible and vivid example of the uh, scandal of our condition, and that is HD sufferers here in South America. So I would like now everyone who is here, who is a part of the Latin American network, to stand up, please, so that we can show just some of uh, deep admiration and uh, gratitude. Please. And I have gone the whole uh, week without remote mentioning even once my old career as an NBC journalist, or even the letters NBC. Um, but I'm going to break that rule now, and I'm just going to just to relate one story um, to show, you know, how the, what the Latin American network I believe uh, shows us that the human spirit is capable of anything. Um, in 1991, after the Gulf War that did not remove Saddam Hussein. I went to the Iranian border with Iraq after rumors that Kurdish refugees were spilling across it. And what we found there was a sea of humanity pouring over those mountains. A million people, mostly women and children, running from Saddam's chemical attacks in the north of Iraq. It was winter, it was bitterly cold, and the sights would never have been believed had there not been a cameraman there. With the image imprinted in my mind till the day I die, was one particular girl of about 12. She was clambering over those rocks, focused on survival. Her face was dripping with freezing mud. On her back, her younger sister, two or three years old, 
unconscious and barely alive. She had carried that child almost 130 kilometers. All humans are capable of far more than you can ever believe. Thank you very much, Rio, for having us here. Good night. Thank you, Charles. And I just wanted to close our final live Brasilia session um, with some words from someone else that were brought to my attention by an HD family member. Uh, it's almost exactly 50 years to the day since Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech. And this is the, the uh, Ma uh, Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, DC. Uh, on the side of it, some words of Dr. King's, which I think are relevant to what we've seen this week and what will be carrying away from us from this Congress, out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope. We hope that you have taken some small stones of hope from these sessions and from the Congress, which you will carry with you and will continue to uh, remain hopeful and optimistic for the better future which awaits us all. So that's it uh, from us on the stage. Uh, but of course, the Congress continues tomorrow, as do our live updates via Twitter uh, and at hdbuzz.net, and the videos of these sessions that we're making will be available online so you can share with your friends and family. Uh, stay here for Ding Ding Dong, safe travels, thank you for coming, uh, and good night.